Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are continuing to work our way through the Gospels. This is Gospels Part 93. Last week we continued our story where Jesus had received news that his friend Lazarus had fallen ill in Bethany. Oh. Uh, and we had this very mysterious timing issue where you would think a good friend would come right to the aid of a, a friend who is ailing, but the text told us that he stayed behind two days longer before beginning to travel to Bethany. And it yeah. was hinting at some type of uh, divine providence, maybe, that Jesus had going on to showcase the glory of who he was and his father through what the uh, the re- redemptive arc of Lazarus' story is going to be before we get to the end. Um, speaking right. of redemptive arcs, they get to Bethany, and of all people to come and meet him at the home, uh, Martha, the sister of Mary, comes to visit him first, uh, and kind of showing this, we kind of touched on maybe a repentant heart in terms of how she reacted last time when she was the the busybody, the servant in the home while Jesus was there teaching, and this time she she wanted to have face-to-face, one to, one-on-one time to say that, I wish you were here sooner because my brother would still be alive, and right. he's consoling her about it and telling her that it's going to show the glory of the Son of Man and the glory of the Father, and then... We ended off with talking about the Jewish picture of grieving and mourning, sitting Shiva, and Mary went back into the house and told, or Martha went back into the house to tell Mary that Jesus was there, and it was this very provocative thing where she got up and like ran out of the house to find Jesus, and then everybody else who was typically just sitting there kind of solemn, grim, uh, sharing the space with the mourning people all ran out too. It's this super yeah. provocative thing, and that's where we dropped off last week. Yeah, and and remember that Jesus he actually stayed outside of town. So we were kind of looking at how Martha was, you know, walking all the way there, walking all the way back home, walking all the oh, way yeah. back out there. <laughs> so yeah, it's a very interesting picture. We're going to continue the story. You know, it's actually, Sammy, what we need to do is grab hold of some hands and pull everybody up off of that cliff we left them hanging over. And we're going to pick up at John chapter 11. We're going to read verses 32 through 37. It's just going to continue the story. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Oh, boy, Samuel. There's a lot of stuff in here. Yeah. Let's, let's, yeah, well, let's, let's just start and let's see if we can get through it. So, first thing, very interesting. Mary says to Jesus... The exact same thing that Martha said. If you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Now, we don't know if in real life both women actually said the same identical thing or if this is just John's way of telling the story. Whatever. We don't really care that much. But very interesting. They said the exact same thing. They both called him Lord. Now, to be fair... In this day and time, that was used in many different ways. You you could have been referring to someone as, you know, like God, or just Master, or 
even something as simple as sir. But they both used it, and I have to believe in their case it was, you know, way more like master leaning toward God kind of stuff, right? But Mary does something a little bit differently than Martha. Did you pick up on that, Samuel? See what she did? Um, she fell at his feet. Yeah. And now, we've seen others do this. Uh, Jairus was one back in Mark 5.22. Uh, there was a woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit in Mark 7.25. And I bet this is not even going to be the last time we see this. But it's a, it's a show of, uh, what are some good words? Reverence, uh, respect, submission, even. And she didn't just fall at his feet. She wept. So, at the very least, we can see that Mary still seems to feel things more deeply than Martha. And you know what? I already feel like I need to correct myself. Maybe we shouldn't say she feels them more deeply. She openly expresses them. Martha could be feeling it just as deeply. She just She's a different personality. She just kind of holds it in. But here's the cool part. Jesus, he is moved by this. And this, this, is, this is all kind of confusing. It says uh, he's deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. So the picture that's painted here, if we're just kind of trying to get into the words and the text a little bit, he is affected inside and out. So in his spirit... And, and these are really strong words. He's vehemently agitated, uh, indignant, or, I mean, here's a weird one. It, it's, it's almost like he's rebuking himself. Now, we have no idea, you know, in what way that might mean. I don't know if he's trying to hold himself back from doing something miraculous too quick, too soon, or, or I, if he should have thought he should have been here sooner. I, I mean, there's no way to know, but the, he's, he is really upset on the inside, in his spirit. Now, the, and funny, the underlying words, words like at their root, Samuel, they actually referred to like snorting or growling. Now, I'm not saying that we should read them as if they're literally that, but they that gives you an idea of what's going on inside him. So he's violently agitated on the inside, but it isn't just inside. He was also shaking and shuddering, visibly deserve, disturbed. That's the greatly troubled part. So he's messed up on the inside. He's messed up on the outside. And, you know, a lot of people have speculated about what this could be. Some think that it was just that he was angry. And, well, angry at what? Well, he could have been angry at unbelief, or he could have been angry at sin, or he could have been angry at death, he could have been angry, angry at the hypocrisy of the mourners, if, if you think that some of the mourners were there hypocritically or whatever. I don't know. Now, I don't discount any of that, for sure. But I think it's also reasonable, I would even go so far as to say likely, that he was feeling the grief of that moment. Again, a, a little bit empathetic. He's, he's in some sense feeling the pain of the others, these others that he loves. And then, of course, you know, he's also lost his good friend. Now, to be fair, we know that this all, it kind of appears to be part of a plan, right? He's going to let Lazarus die. He's going to let him stay dead long enough for everything to be undeniable. And then I hate to do like a spoiler alert or something like that, but I mean, you know, everybody's heard this story mostly anyway, he's going to raise him up. And this seems like it's the story all along. And yet, right in the middle of this, it seems that Jesus is sincerely moved by this moment. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it, Samuel? It is odd. Yeah. He knows what he's going to do, and yet he's really bad. So he wants to go to the tomb. He asks, and they respond. And then, of course, what do we get? The famous... Shortest verse in the Bible. Say it one more time, Samuel. Jesus wept. Yeah, yeah. Now think about that. He I, he knows what he's going to do. 
but he's crying. He is truly feeling everything that's going on in this moment as a human. I mean, it's all been too much. He's, he's feeling the force of his humanity, and it kind of breaks him down. He, he weeps, and it's not just a tear. It's, it's many tears. It's, it's weeping. This is intense. And then, you know, you've got to ask yourself, God, I mean, did he really know? what he was about to do. I mean, I mean, we think that he does. I don't know. It's just weird. If you had a friend die, Samuel, and you knew that you could or would raise them to life again, would you be crying? I think I'd be pretty pumped. <laughs> yeah. And even if everybody around you was crying, I mean, would that, would you be crying? I feel like I'd just be holding this huge present behind my back, just like, just wait, guys, the hype e- train's coming. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I, I I kind of feel like I'd be wearing that little sly smirk, you know? <laughs> you all are about to see something super cool, and you don't even know it. I think that this helps us to see Jesus more clearly. He was compassionate. He was sympathetic. He was empathetic. He felt his humanity to his very core. I I think every bit as much, or I don't know, maybe more than you and I do. He was God. Nobody's arguing that. But at the same time, so, so human. And I know I've said this before, just keep saying it. That's encouraging to me. Seeing how this man lived as a human gives me hope of what I might be able to do, just attempting to image God, walk in righteousness, be justice and mercy and forgiveness and love and everything here on the earth. But whatever, I digress. For what it's worth, just to mention it, toward the end, we had some in the crowd who, you know, they recognize who Jesus is and, you know, they're kind of recalling some of his miracles and things. Uh, But we also had some who are, uh, well, that's, no, hold on. Let me finish my thought. He, these people who recognized him re- recalled some of his miracles. They were also kind of questioning why it was that Jesus didn't heal Lazarus before he died. And you know what? I, I, we should just keep reading. So let's just say that the answer is forthcoming. Now, before you get to that forthcoming, uh-huh. uh, I do I do have a question. Um, yeah. I totally am on board with emphasizing this possible like interpretation of Jesus's reaction here of explaining that it, he's truly showing his humanity and how he was empathetic to the the human problem of sin and death and how that affects our bodies our relationships um, here on earth but I wonder and I don't know Paul whether you have had any exposure to any possible scholarly insights especially within the Jewish realm on the possibility of him also being emotional and seeing his friend being dead being in a tomb like this maybe call from his father to raise him up from the dead that he was a for seeing the foreshadowing of his own end of his story with coming closer to the sting of his own death um, and then, you know, thinking about, you know, well, all of his disciples who have been his closest friends for past three years or so are going to yeah. abandon him, leave him. Um, they're all going to feel alone. They're going to get martyred. Um, and that he, not, not to take away from him being emotional because his friend had died, but also adding emotion in that gosh, like Lazarus' story right now feels so much like what, you know, up on the mountain, what Moses and Elijah told me how my story is going to end. And like, it's scary. Like, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm emotional. I I don't want to do this. Like, I don't know what, what, any thoughts on that? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm continuing your thought. Even the idea of when he does die and he is in the tomb, what are his friends going to be going through at that moment? What kind of pain and hurt are they going to be feeling while he is in the grave? Now, granted, it's only for a short time, but yeah, all of those things. Well, uh, to answer directly, I don't know of any particular 
you know, uh, writings, uh, any, anybody that I have read, scholarly or not, uh, about that. But Samuel, I think it's a, I mean, I think that's a great point. I mean, the, all of this, the, the basic mystery is, okay, so here's Jesus. He knows what he's going to do, and yet he's crying. What is going on there? Well, everything that we say is pretty much speculation. So your idea, your thought, your question, I think it's just as good as anything I said. And and I think I think it's great. Whatever mm. picture you can get in your head. I, but I, the only thing that I would say is that still somewhere in all of that, I think foundationally, something about this has to relate back to his humanity. Mm. You know? But I, I don't I don't even know if that's a fact. That's just how I feel about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm also getting some illusions of the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, weeping over the nation yeah. and their strife and predicaments. There might be some connections there, too. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. It's it's just a funny thing. I mean, most people talk about this. They talk about, oh, the shortest verse of the Bible, Jesus wept. Oh, yeah, wasn't that great? He, You know, he, he felt things just like we did. But you sort of miss that basic underlying story of, yeah, but he knows what he's going to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I, I love it. And uh, an important rhetorical question to ask yourself, like to fight that lullaby effect is, have you ever in, like, in your own personal life experienced someone weeping in, your, in, in their presence? Um, and if you have, you know how... Right. Just so vulnerable that person is at that moment, and it's just it's overwhelming to even witness someone else weeping um, in the way that the text is describing Jesus weeping there. So it's just this, a good reminder just to keep in mind of those times that we experience in human life to get you a better picture of yeah. um, what his reaction and behavior was in this moment. Yeah, so good. Yeah, that lullaby effect, the idea that you've either read it or heard it so many times you're not really even paying attention to what's there. And so don't don't read like that. Let your Bible come to life. Look at all the words. Try and figure out what what is going on. All of a sudden it's going to feel a lot more vague and empty. <laughs> you know, because you're you're trying to really see what's happening there, but well, let's go on. Let's see. I mean, we should at least head toward the end of the story, right? So oh, we're yeah. still in John chapter 11. We're looking at verses 38 through 44. It says this. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> there is no movie or story. Written. Nothing is as good as the Bible, man. This is so cool. So Jesus, uh, he, he is deeply moved again. And I know I tried to show how, you know, strong and, and powerful the words we were talking about before were. This, this text is even more emphatic. Again, we get this, this image of the, 
you know, we talked about like that violent agitation within coupled with this idea of, I don't know, uh, even the, the rebuking or restraining himself in some way. I mean, it's, it's very, very mysterious. Now, you could paint your own picture of what you think's going on in him, but I, I imagine this. So we know uh, in this podcast, we've tried to present it along the lines of, look, he is God, he is human, but he's trying to live in his humanity. So there's, there's this idea where it's like he is self-limiting the God side of him. He's, he's living as a human and, and all the amazing miracles and everything come through the Holy Spirit and all that. It's a great picture for us. So anyway, he chooses to walk fully in his humanity, even though he's God, and the power he exhibits, it's coming from the Holy Spirit, and his struggle then is in this. How does he not, I mean, I get it, this is going to sound weird because we're talking about God, but, you know, his struggle is in not rashly acting in his divinity, but in fact, waiting on the Spirit. So it's the idea of, hey, you know what? Maybe it's kind of hard to self-limit, right? Or maybe because he is both God and man, maybe that humanity, <laughs> you know, there's there's kind of a, a, an, a, a, an effect in there that it, it makes it harder. I don't know. It's, it's almost like a temptation of sorts. Now, we've seen him overcome all that before, but maybe that's what's going on in him. And again, we see him elevate God's will above his own. And and again, I, I mean, for somebody who knows what he's about to do, they, I mean, this could be a mighty struggle. But whatever. Again, you can paint your own picture. I just think, you know, Jesus is going through a tough time right in this moment. And, and you would think, knowing what he's going to do, it wouldn't be there, but it is. So anyway, Samuel, tombs says here that it was a cave and it had a stone laid on it. Actually, that was super common. That's what most of them looked like. Now, sometimes it was a natural cave. Sometimes they'd actually carve them out themselves or whatever. But it, 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 was, it was most common. So like in this era, when, when Lazarus would have died, that you were to be entombed. But this was only for a limited period of time. You were waiting for all the decomp to be complete. Hope that's not too gross for anybody, <laughs> but that's what you do. You, you'd put someone in a tomb, wait for them to, you know, basically just become bone-like or whatever, and then you would actually collect all those bones. You remove them. You kind of ceremonially, ceremonially, <laughs> that's a tough word, ceremonially wash them and you kind of anoint things, get them all wrapped up or whatever, and then you would keep all these little bone pieces. It wasn't like a skeleton anymore. It was just all the individual pieces. You would keep those in a box. They even have a name for it. It's an ossuary or something like that. I don't even know how to pronounce it. And and uh, usually uh, they were made of stone. Now, it would depend on, you know, your circumstance. Maybe you were richer or poorer or something like that. But, you know, most common, the majority would have been stone. And it, I don't know. You You think about that process. It's almost like cremation except cremation light and as if it was done by the slow-mo guys instead of <laughs> you know in a furnace really fast right so anyway there's the idea of of the way it looked back then so so they get to this tomb which is just a cave and jesus commands the stone that's covering it to be moved now this is also interesting things you would never think of some suggest that this indicates that it's a private tomb, right? They put Jesus in it, and then they put a stone on it, and they're suggesting, well, maybe he was the only one in there. Uh, you mean Lazarus, real quick? You said put I'm Jesus. Sorry. Did okay. I see Jesus? That happened. You did. <laughs> yeah, they put Lazarus in there, and and here's the thing. Uh, if it was a private tomb, they think that this is suggesting that Lazarus was uh, maybe prominent or wealthy or something like that. And they have other reasons for thinking that, and this just kind of adds to it. But, you know, we don't know. I just write that down as a maybe. But anyway, Jesus commands the stone to be moved, and, you know, presumably some guys jump into action. I don't know who, but they did it. But Martha, <laughs> and again, we're pointing out that, you know, she either came with Mary or she's maybe shown up since, whatever. But Martha... 
she's having a little reality check and she decides to share it. She informs Jesus of some basic facts. (laughs) Lazarus has been dead for four days. Now, the other whether you want to call them resuscitations or resurrections or whatever, Jairus' daughter, the son of the widow, okay? Those happened on the same day that they died. This particular one, this exceeds the traditional max of three days. And now, what are you talking about, this max of three days? There was this Jewish tradition, and it basically it was this idea that, well, look, when somebody dies— This is the way they thought of it. Somebody died, their spirit would sort of hover, hang around for a period of time, just in case you might somehow be revived. And, And the theory was that that spirit, the maximum amount of time that that spirit might hang around would be three days. I don't know exactly where they get that, but just, just, it was a thing. And so it's important, he's been dead four days. So at least in the the first century Israel Jewish mindset, there is no one who would ever, ever, ever think that Lazarus wasn't really dead. Been four days. And (laughs) Martha, again, helping out, in case Jesus has forgotten, four-day-old dead bodies stinketh, (laughs) to use the King James. You know what I'm saying? Now, I I know it's a bit of a macabre thing to say, but it emphasizes one important fact. He was completely, totally, and in every other way, dead. There was no coming back from this. Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. Now, in Martha's mind, and we just read it uh, earlier, uh, not this episode, earlier episode, his... His only hope lay in the resurrection at the end of days. If we recall that earlier conversation, that's what she said. But Jesus told her, do you remember Samuel? You remember how he responded? Because it's kind of cool. Uh, I don't off the top of my head, no. Yeah. All right. So, So she was looking to the end of days and he said, no, I am the resurrection and the life. This thing that you think is coming at the end of days, like, it's it's me, and I'm standing right in front of you, right? And then it said that she believed, and she ultimately acknowledged that he is the Christ, he is the Messiah. And in a way, because she's now saying, uh, God, or Jesus, sorry, I don't know what to tell you, he's been dead four days, I mean, he's, he's going to stink, right? So it kind of looks like she's quickly gone back to her old way of thinking. And that could be true, I don't know, but if it is... That's just another life lesson for us. Be careful when you get so connected to a thing, you hold on so tightly to a thing, sometimes it's really, really hard to get out of it. But that may or may not be what's going on in here. And real quick, at least to Martha's credit, I mean, this reaction happened to Jesus' own disciples as well, where he asked them things if they believed, and... They all oh, yeah. responded, "We do," and then later they're like, "It's almost Ooh. like they didn't un- they didn't understand <laughs> yeah. Yeah. what it was that they were believing." So, like, there could be some of that at play too. That oh, yeah. in the way that she was able to comprehend what she was acknowledging, she like it was real, it was truthful. But then in this moment, like it, it was hard to connect the dots of when he said he is the resurrection and the life to this moment, right in the present for her. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we had Martha's back recently, and we still do. Oh, she's I'm still good. Team Martha. <laughs> yeah, she's good, right? All right, so so, so we get this far, and then Jesus says something. Okay, number one, it's really important, but it's also just really strange, at least in its wording. And and it'll depend on what version you're reading. I, I can't even comprehend why we're reading ESV right now. I can't even comprehend why they said it the way they did, but whatever. He thanks God for hearing him. And even better, you you might say he's thanking God for listening to him, right? And that, that, you know, easily transfers, relates to us, whatever. But what what we don't know, at least it wasn't in the story, we kind of have to assume that Jesus has been praying leading up to this moment, 
or maybe also left out of the story, he may have prayed a little bit right then and there, and, you know, people sort of witnessing or whatever. We don't really know. But either way, or, or I guess, to be fair, maybe it was both, right? He thanks God for, you know, listening. He thanks him for hearing, for answering. But then he says he's thanking him for always hearing him. And then he adds, and side note, notice that he's speaking to God, but he's actually talking out loud because he wants the crowd to hear it. He adds that, you know, he, Jesus, he already knew for himself. I mean, he knew God was always hearing him, right? He only said it out loud for the sake of the other people. But then this is important. What is it that he wants the other people to know? And it, it, it's not obvious from the story, but he wants them to know that God sent him. And this connects us back to John chapter 11, verse 4. So what was that last episode? Maybe the one before, whatever. It's recently. Uh, Do you remember how he stated it, Samuel? Uh, Here, read that little part right there from John 11, 4. Mm -hmm. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Okay. Now, Now, when you hear that, When it says that it's for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it, I don't know. That doesn't sound like Jesus is thinking that he wants everybody to know that God sent him. I mean, it feels different. And here's what I mean. You might think so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. You might think that that would mean that Jesus was somehow emphasizing his own glory. Uh, you know, uh, like maybe doing this for the crowd. But that but that doesn't fit. That doesn't fit with any of Jesus' behavior before. In fact, he is instead doing the opposite. What he's doing is emphasizing his own dependence on the Father. So you kind of get this dual thing going on. Jesus may have authority and power, etc. I mean, all of those things, yes, but... The source is still God. And I think that is an important image to see. Important image to see. So, well, where are we at? Sorry, I got excited. I've got into the story myself, and now I forgot what I was doing. Um, Oh, whoa, whoa. So then we get the big climax of the story. Jesus, (laughs) how could I forget that? (laughs) So Jesus commands Lazarus to come forth. And guess what happens, Samuel? He comes out. (laughs) That's right. He does. He's still got all of this burial dressing on him. And I mean, it's probably, I don't know, a little bit hard to move. You know, they got these things knotted up and it's, you know, wrapped around the hands and feet and everything's covering up his face. So unlike Jesus, and and this is, this is a neat picture. We have to look forward a little bit. Remember when Jesus was resurrected, Samuel? I know we haven't gotten there yet, but you know the story just generally in your mind. What did he do with his burial clothes? Weren't they all folded up nice and neat when all of his disciples came to the empty tomb? Yeah, he left them behind. They were all nicely folded, whatever. So, unlike Jesus, when Lazarus comes out, he is still bound. And and what we could say is that he's bound to die again. It isn't the same kind of resurrection that Jesus has. His is to eternal life. But anyway, Jesus commands that he be set free from all of that stuff. And I don't know, maybe it was the same guys that quickly jumped up and moved the stone. They, they start unwrapping Lazarus. So now we have to go back. This sickness, it actually did not lead to death. And the, the reason I say it that way is because, well, we went through death along the way, (laughs) but that's not where we ended up. That's not what it led to. So that's all I'm saying. It really didn't lead to death. In that sense, Jesus wasn't wrong and he wasn't lying or, you know, whatever. Now, it might sound weird to say this right here because Lazarus was just raised from the dead. Was he not? He was. I'm going to say it anyway. Poor Lazarus. Because what we're going to see later... (laughs) This guy comes back to life. The Sanhedrin, the, the, so a lot of the guys that are trying to figure a way to, to kill Jesus, 
Well, later they're going to want to try to kill Lazarus too. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, seriously, I die, I get raised, and now you want to kill me? That's just wrong. But anyway, in their mind, he was just the cause of too many people basically believing in this Jesus character, right? So they want to get rid of him too. I know we did something similar to this recently. I think it was about the I am statements, but I'm I'm concerned. Maybe we haven't done a really good job of tracking the uh, seven signs that are in the book of John. Uh, just to recount them real quickly, we've got, he changed water to wine. He did that healing back in Cana. And he did the healing in Bethesda. And then we had the feeding of the 5,000. We had uh, the blind man in Jerusalem. And now we have the raising of of Lazarus. And if you were counting, Samuel, that's six. We've only got one more to go. And if you see how the miracles keep sort of increasing in their power or their uh, what, they're, what they're trying to teach us or show us about the kingdom or whatever, Samuel, can you guess what sign number seven is going to be? Might be a way bigger resurrection in terms of character and level of importance exactly yeah we've got we've got jesus's resurrection coming up but yeah anyway there you go uh that's everything about that section what do you got sam before we go on so uh real quick we're at while at, we're at this point before i go back a little bit these seven signs that you're referencing that we've been trying to keep track of and john are those seven signs of the kingdom that jesus was proclaiming or inaugurating or was it seven signs um, confirming his messiahship identity like what what would be the title of the the list of those seven signs like what are they representing yeah that well that's a really good way to phrase that question john john in his writing is trying to emphasize these seven signs and so the question would be well, what was John's real motive in doing that? And Samuel, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to take the cheap way out. We have seen John in so many instances, and oh boy, if we ever get to the book of Revelation and start talking about that, we're going to find out that John has this crazy ability to mean more than one thing at once. He's just really good with the words and the language and the way he he pieces things together and all that. So what I'm going to say is it's definitely seven signs of the kingdom. And it's definitely seven signs that Jesus is the Messiah. (laughs) And if you have any other questions, it's definitely that too. (laughs) Nice. Yeah. I see. You know, I mean, the way you phrase the question, uh, I don't know. I mean, that that seems like, boy, that would be in the mind of John. What was he really trying to show us there? And I bet you if we zipped around in some commentaries, I bet you we'd find lots of disagreement. Lots of great mm-hmm. ideas, but lots of disagreement about what his real purpose was. But yeah, that's a good question. All right, anything yeah. else? Sorry. Uh, sure. It's kind of the same point that I brought up in the previous section, but again, if, while you were hearing Paul read through this section... It, it's hard for me not to see the foreshadowing images of Jesus's resurrection to come, and I'm not sure whether this was intentional on John's part in the language that he uses, or if it was intentional on God's part in the you know the narrative of how he was weaving all of these stories together through Jesus's ministry. Yeah. Um, but like, if we just go back to the text, like uh, chapter eleven, verse thirty-eight. They came to a tomb. It was a cave. A stone lay against it. I mean, let's look at Jesus' tomb. Right. It was also cave-like. It also had a stone against it. Yeah. Um, and then, like, verse 39 and both uh, at the end of verse 43. So at the, end of ver- at the beginning of verse 39, it says, Jesus said, take away the stone. And then if we cut down to the end of um, verse 43... It says he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. So we see here, like, Jesus is showcasing authority in this circumstance to bring Lazarus back to life. 
And then, yeah. and then if we push forward in Jesus' circumstance, who is it that has the authority to bring him back to life? It's it's his Father. It's the God yeah. who is in heaven. And I just wonder, like, if listeners of John's account, like, I mean, of course it was written years after all this happened, but those reading or hearing this for the first time, when they got to this part of the story, they would be like, oh, oh like there's something intentional here. Like I know what, what they're trying to point us to. And like, it's like getting me excited for what's to come to remind me of the hope yeah. that we have. I don't know. It's just, I just think that the images there are really cool. I think that they're more linked than people give them credit for. And that we should probably like stress the importance of the connection between Lazarus and, and Jesus's resurrections. Yeah. yeah. Well, and to, again, just to continue with your thinking, look at verse 40, Jesus says to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Well, yeah, you see it in him raising someone else. But when do we really, really, really see the glory of God? Mm -hmm. When Jesus gets raised, right? So, and you're going to see that. And he's been, you know, he's been hinting at that and all of that all along. So, yeah, good point, Samuel. Very good. Anything else? No, nope, I think we should find out what the heck Lazarus is doing now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it's going to tell us a tremendous amount, but that's okay. We'll just keep going with the story, and we will hear more later. So in John, as we're still in chapter 11, let's look at verses 45 to 48. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Hmm. Okay, so a little more side story going on. Let's see what they get. So we mentioned earlier that we had many Jews that had come from Jerusalem to mourn with Mary and Martha. Now, just a little side note, when we say so many times when John is talking about the Jews, he's either talking about specifically Judeans and even more specifically people from Jerusalem a lot of times he's talking about the Jewish leadership itself, which, of course, had its place there in Jerusalem. Um, so we don't know who these people are exactly. They're Jews that had come from Jerusalem. They're mourning. But after seeing all of this, we have two very different responses from them. Many, and that, that's important, many believed that he was from God, that he was the Messiah. But then some went to the Pharisees. And they reported, hey, this, this Jesus just raised this guy from the dead. And again, I think it would be important for us to note, it was reported to certain Pharisees, some Pharisees, not all Pharisees everywhere, just, just some certain ones. Now, these Pharisees, they get together with the chief priests, which is weird because they're not normally cozy, but... They, they get this council together, and that is the Sanhedrin. We aren't really sure, was it like, you know, the full, or did they just get their buddies enough to, to run the show? Or I, I don't know. But among those in the Sanhedrin, at least generally speaking, there were those who were friends of Jesus. You might even think of like Nicodemus. And there were enemies of Jesus, all in the same group. It appears, however, that his enemies were, eh, let's just say, more bold than his friends, at least generally speaking. In this particular meeting, however, they were discussing a topic that would have been important to them all. And that, that's important to see. Israel, the nation, they had been given this special designation from Rome. And though they were under Rome's power, authority, control, whatever, they did also have a measure of independence. They had some ability to handle their own internal affairs, not entirely, but for the most part, and, and they feared losing this special status. 
And and the way they said it here was that they were going to lose their place. And with that, they feared that the nation itself might be lost. Uh, part of that special status was just the, the simple fact that they could worship God. They could continue in their religion and not participate in Roman religion, where their gods, whatever. Now, so, real quick, was that unique for the nation of Israel, like other nations that Rome was controlling or occupying? Did they not have that same luxury that Israel had, like in this current time? Yeah, yeah. I I don't know that we can say it is unique, as in they were the only ones that ever got this, but it was definitely rare. Hmm. Definitely rare. And so it was it was a very very special good thing. Now, now these guys okay, so their fear it's based in this. What they're afraid of is that Jesus is going to become so popular that he's going to be perceived from both within Israel and without Israel as a leader, a powerful new leader. And with all the, you know, the Messiah talk or whatever that goes with it, it isn't just leader. We're talking about king. And so, you know, this guy, as far as they're concerned anyway, he's just another in a line of would-be Messiah kings. You know, surely he's going to make his move soon. That's what they expect Jesus to do. He's, he's building this movement, and at some point— He's going he's gonna to really lay it on everybody, right? And just to be fair, I mean, they weren't thinking in a crazy manner. They had plenty of reason to think this way. And this would have presented a very real and very present danger to Israel. You know, if he really were just a man. But he's not. He was man and God. He was Messiah, right? So, so we still got some bad guys here. But they're not like crazy, irrational bad guys. They're just wrong. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. They're The ones that were rational in this were probably using the nation's previous struggles or realities of exile were probably creeping back into their minds and yeah. were somehow thinking that this Jesus was going to ultimately lead to another exile, which is ironic that... <laughs> it's it's through the killing of this Jesus that led to events that confirmed that fear of theirs in like <laughs> in the end in 70 AD is that Jesus right. pr- prophesied and predicted it's like they yeah. could have prevented it if they had just accepted him yeah oh you're exactly right and okay i don't know if everybody's going to see it the way i do but what you just said sparked something in me this is like a, a wonderful segue into the next section. So let's go ahead and do that because <laughs> this, this is really cool. Is that, again, we're in chapter 11 of John where this is verses 49 to 52. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Okay, so you got to understand that right here in this spot, you've got John doing storytelling, and then you also follow that with John offering his own commentary on the story, okay? But this, this I think it is jaw-droppingly cool. So you've got this high priest, Caiaphas. He is a Sadducee. So he steps into this conversation. They're like, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to lose our place. We're going to lose our nation. Caiaphas steps in and what he's attempting to do is just drop some simple truth, some pragmatic truth. And he becomes an inadvertent prophet. See, the high priest was expected to fill 
the role of prophet to some degree, you know, on occasion. And so this wasn't unusual. It's just that in this case, he appears to be completely unaware of what he has done. See, it appears his intention is to convince the others that there's an obvious answer to their question. Their question was, well, what are we to do? His answer was, you just need to kill him. And his reasoning is simple. The very lives of an entire nation of people are at risk. You eliminate that risk, that is, kill this one man, and you save the lives of many. Now, again, to be fair, this probably isn't the worst reasoning you've ever heard in your life. I mean, it makes some sense. But John then goes on and he highlights for us the true nature of what Caiaphas has actually said. Jesus' death wasn't about saving the nation from a potentially bad Roman response. In fact, to your point, Samuel, and this is where it comes in, that's going to happen anyway in about 40 years with the 70 AD, the loss of the temple, the whole thing. Jesus' death instead was about saving the nation as a fulfillment of the promise. God was restoring everything. So Jesus' death would actually bring victory over death and offer true life, eternal life. Something, ironically, that Caiaphas didn't even believe in. And as if that wasn't enough, it wasn't even limited to Israel. Again, it was fulfilling the promise Israelites in the land, Israelites scattered abroad, and all of the other nations would be one, at least, you know, regarding the assembly of believers. So, Samuel, uh, let's, let's do a little reminder. Go back to Genesis chapter 22 and read verses 15 through 18. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. And that is the promise. And it's being fulfilled right here. You see that it's, it's to Abraham, it's for his offspring, which ultimately is the nation of Israel, and through Israel, in Israel, Israel, which I should say it that way because we get grafted in, in Israel, all nations of the earth will be blessed. So anyway, it's, it's a great, great picture. And okay, earlier I said, poor Lazarus. How about now we go, poor Caiaphas. <laughs> he unwittingly played the stooge in our story. God is speaking prophecy through a wicked and evil man. And this is not going to be either the first or the last time. And this is one of those moments when you just got to go, his ways are not our ways. And it's mm. another, it's just a life lesson. God does some crazy cool stuff. Mm. So your comment here at the end, God speaking through prophecy through a wicked and evil man, we're not to take this account from Caiaphas that what he was saying was fueled by good intentions. He is to be treated as one of the enemies, uh, one of the opponents of Jesus as Messiah here. That is the way I see it, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that that's what John is trying to get across. It's like, here's Caiaphas saying this thing. He's saying it for his own reasons, for his own thinking, for his own purposes, and yet... It really, it really wasn't of his own accord. He he was prophesying, and he just didn't understand what was even coming out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. I just, I, it's such an amazing picture. And then again, I don't know. Maybe there's another way to look at it, and I'm totally wrong. But that's, I don't know. I think that's what John's trying to tell us. Well, Samuel, so, we go. What? Go ahead. Oh, 
I, I'm just wrestling here because in verse 51 and 52 where it says he did not say this of his own accord and like what you said he's high priest that year he prophesies he would die for the nation and then verse 52 not only for the nation but to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad so yeah like like to me unequivocally it's it's hard to interpret that any other way compared to the fulfillment of the promise that we read here in Genesis 22 um but in Caiaphas's case like like what you said there at the end with his ways being higher than our, our ways how as a prophet who while being an enemy of God or like of God's sent son sent messiah can speak words so true i don't know and <laughs> like was he not even coherent in the things that he was prophesying like i'm just really struggling at how he could say these things and yet not understand them if do you know what do you know what i'm getting at do you do you see the struggle that i'm having right now yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. If, if any one of us were to try to put ourselves in Caiaphas's shoes, this seems super, super weird. I, maybe, maybe we could say it another way. Um, I'm not so certain that Caiaphas was aware in the moment that he was, in fact, prophesying. So if Caiaphas is in this meeting and he's talking, he's going, you guys don't understand anything. This is a real problem, but it's easy to solve. What's on the line here is the lives of pretty much the entire nation. So guess what? You kill that one guy, all those lives are saved. I mean, from his perspective, he may have just been speaking in like the most natural sense possible, not, not aware of anything. What, what John is trying to do is to, is to show that in that, and and whether Caiaphas was fully aware or only partially aware or not aware at all, he still was actually doing the work. He was, in fact, prophesying about Jesus dying for the nation. So, I, I don't know. Sam, I mean, I, I totally get what you're saying. It's like, how could this guy do this? How could he go through with this? But, I mean, he could have remained unaware. For all I know, he he remained unaware even till he died. But I don't know. Right. I I think I'm understanding more now with what you're saying, John, as the narrator is doing in verse 51, because I was treating it, especially that phrase, um, but being high priest that year, he prophesied. Um, I was treating that as past tense, that like he had been chosen as high priest for that year and that previously in his tenure as high priest he had said the statement at the end of 51 and 52 like elsewhere and that this was more oh. confirmation of what he had said previously but you're saying that like unbeknownst to him in verse 49 and 50 like, you know, end of Genesis, what you intended for harm, God turned it into good uh, yes. through, through his words. Yes. I'm sorry. So, yeah, I wasn't picking up on the confusion there. So that's good. Yes, we see the light. Now, <laughs> here's here's a real question, Samuel. We got two verses left in this section, and we're at, we're at the end of our time. Should we force people to go a few minutes over so we can reach the end of a section? I mean, we we were hanging off of a cliff last time. We might as well jump over the crevasse this week and get to the <laughs> other side. All right, here we go. Really quick. John chapter 11, verses 53 and 54. So, from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, to a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. So, uh, whether Caiaphas really was a, a stooge in this story or not, I mean, his words had a very real influence in the story, at least the way John is telling it. They agreed 
uh, okay, probably not unanimously, but whatever, they agreed he must die. And this was not an empty threat. And Jesus, he was taking the whole thing quite seriously. And at this point in John's telling of the story, he actually stops walking open, openly among the Jews. And, and you know, that could have been the Jews of Jerusalem, and, and or it could have been he tried to, you know, stay away from as many people as he could. I don't know. He went to a town, so whatever. He and the disciples go to Ephraim. And this is, you know, near the wilderness, so it's probably not super populated. We don't really know where exactly this Ephraim is. A popular estimate or guess is that it's about 12 miles north and four miles east of Jerusalem. Could be right, could be wrong, I don't know. But you get the idea. They were laying low. And probably even more now than they were the last time they tried to get out of sight, out of mind. I don't know if you remember that. They went off to where John was baptizing at the first, all of that. Anyway, he tried. they get out of sight, out of mind. And, and as far as we know, we have no recorded miracles or teaching from this little time away. And we don't exactly know how long it was. Probably is measured in weeks. But if it is, it's only a few. But there you go. It's kind of the end of that story. That's interesting. Um, oh, well, we're already past, so I'm just going to ask it anyway. You may as well. Um, is there any connection or importance to the place that John, the writer, mentions that Jesus is going to? Um, I'm, I'm, how do you pronounce it? Ephraim? Um, in uh, reference to kind of like a messianic prophecy in the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. I'm not sure if these two locations are similar or they just look look and sound similar, but they're actually different places. But the verse says, But you, Bethlehem, Epaphra, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one for me who will rule over Israel. Um, so I, w- I just wonder if that Epaphra is within the same region as Ephraim, uh, like here in the gospel narrative. Yeah. Well, I can answer with great confidence. I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. It, it could be, but I, I don't think anybody's ever going to solve that because nobody even really knows where Ephraim is. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just a guess, what we talked about. I, I don't know, Samuel. And I mean, it could. I mean, it, so many things. We have tried on occasion to point out, hey, this points to something in the Old Testament. Hey, this points to something over here. I mean, we're not getting anywhere near all of them. And you got to wonder if we ever will even recognize all the real connections. You know, it, there's so much stuff. So, hey, it's a good reference. Uh, we did we did talk about that particular prophecy before, back around Jesus' birth, mm-hmm. if you remember. But, yep. yeah, it, I mean, it, it could touch with this. I don't know. That's fine with me. Just observation to point out. Yeah, it's good. All right. Unless you got anything else, I think we should let them go, Samuel. Okie dokie. Thanks for listening to the Okie Dokie Most Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Be sure to leave us a rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. You can find out more information about us and the podcast at www.okiedokimos.com. Please feel free to send us any comments or questions you may have at okidokimos at gmail.com and until next time we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who has no need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth we'll talk to you again soon